Woo! <laughs> right? Woo! It was a hot one. Uh, uh, you know what? Here's what I believe about God's family. You should always be able to smile, laugh, joke around. Um, no matter what takes place. I mean, you know, it's, it, for me, it's best when things are going bad. My, my, one of my biggest downfalls is making jokes when things are going bad. Things ain't going bad right now, but I did have a little, a little smile that came my way just before coming up here. But before I say that, um, I also want to uh, let you know, I did take a picture. Um, if you saw me earlier, I, I tried doing some wide angle and, and, and then like three little sections. Because here's the thing, as people are not able to join us physically, man, they miss you so much physically. They're listening in right now, but they miss. Bud and Jane in particular miss you so much. And so uh, I've been sending them uh, bulletins so that they, they actually know what's happening um, in service and, and stuff like that. And, and then it dawned on me as they were saying, you know what? I need to just pause and take a picture so that you can see not what you're missing, but so as you're listening in, you're a part of what is right here under the canopies. And so I, I did take pictures to send to them of us in worship. I hope you guys, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we need to always do, and you can do it with others also, is, is, is bring names forward. They're not forgotten. You know, just because a, a, a thing is, is missing from your side at the moment, they're not forgotten. And so you do everything you can to bring everyone into worship together. And it's kind of exciting. So now the funny thing is, ready? Um, we have a four-foot pool. And uh, when I say we, Michelle bought it years ago. And, uh, and I have been, um, I joke with uh, uh, David Wynn and, and Connie especially, I am the pool boy. They bought the pool, but guess who has to clean it all the time? If you do not clean it all the time, it is terrible. And so I am cleaning all the time the pool. And, uh, and, here's the, and no matter how much you clean it, guess what cleaning doesn't do? It does not heat the water up. It is as cold as the ocean. And uh, so Elijah, who's just about to be seven, he's back there. And he goes, Papa, psst, psst, Papa. Two things. Is church almost over? And I'm like, yes, it is. Papa, are you hot? And I, I'm dripping with sweat. Yes, I am very hot. You going to jump in the pool? Yes, I am. Are you going to stay? Yes, I am. <laughs> but guess what? I have to clean it before we jump in. Just So, so I, you know what? This is a part. I, I say that so you know. This is a part of congregation. It is not just about coming and praying or coming and singing or coming and hearing God's word. It is about gathering together and listening to what ha is happening in the lives of those of us around us and enjoy it. And so, yes, I enjoy that someone else wants me to do the job of cleaning the pool and jumping in. Um, and trust me, it is just so that they can splash you, okay? Now that all of that is out of the way, <laughs> I want to uh, delve into Hebrews chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. And so bear with me for these few moments as we go into it. And I just kind of want to walk us through a little thought process of it. That, um, and I will start off with this. Do you ever wonder why there's an absolute reason to give an oath? Or why does an oath, you know... At, need to be um, followed with like the swearing in of, you know, or so an oath, you have this promise that is made and then someone swears something, something larger than them to kind of back it up. Why do we have to do that? And, and as I started reading these scriptures, there's some things, and I'll probably say it again, that kind of hit me in such a way. You know what? Um, unless it's changed in a court of law, at least on Perry Mason, <laughs> just take you back a ways, at least on Perry Mason, if you went to court, they would call a witness up, and what would they do to the witness? They'd bring him up, and before you can sit in that chair, young man, you have got to place your hand on the Bible, and what do you do? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, what? So help you God? And uh, so 
there is, not only am I going to tell the truth, not only am I going to tell the truth, but I am going to swear by God on high that I will do it. Man, if that doesn't, and I, here's the thing, I do know that there's people that will say that, and then they will turn out and just boldly lie in your face after saying that. And, and I understand that, not, you know, uh, we shouldn't, but it takes place. People don't, they don't uh, honor that. You know, and, and I'm going to tell you what, for a while there, I, I, I kind of struggle, man. And I know there's people that, that str- there are non-Christians that struggle with, oh, I'm not going to put my hand on the Bible and swear to God by it. First of all, I don't even believe in God. Uh, don't that make you start to wonder that, first of all, if they don't believe in God, I'm going to tell you what, for me, your truth level just diminished. Because you have no one that is truth backing you up or leading you forward. And so I struggle with that. And then there's the time where not only um, for those that are struggling with putting their hand on the Bible, but then there were songs that were written. And um, as I said in the court of law, you say, so help me God. And there was one of my favorite bands, DC Talk. They had a song called So Help Me God. I believe it was them. And uh, I'm like, wow. But the more I delved into the song, the more I thought about what was being said, it was, you know what? God, who is all truth, has this backing, has this, this leading of me in truth to you. So then I started going, okay, this, I can handle this. So then as I started reading Hebrews chapter uh, 6, I started getting a greater understanding. So let me help you out here, okay, in these moments. To give an oath, to give a, um, this, this promise backed by God, what does it do? It brings about such confidence in what was said to you, or it should give you confidence in what was said to you. When it is backed by God, it should give you uh, this divine confidence. Now, I'm going to tell you this. What, one of the things when, when it is given, um, well, let's just go kind of secular for a moment. If you give a, a promise to a bank, a bank probably will not just take your word, will it? It'll say, back it up with something. What's your collateral? Collateral. I want all, in fact, I'm going to go with the bank. I want all of it. I want your house. I want your car. I want your guitars. I want all of it. Back it up. And then you find out in the secular world, you know what you find out? Sometimes your stuff is not worth anything. And now you're, okay, my word's not good enough. My collateral that I value is not good enough. But with God, you're going to find out that because of God, that he provides things with his oath. He provides things with his, with his uh, promises. He provides for each and every one of you. And, and, well, let me go this way. If someone makes a promise to you personally, don't you kind of get this little feeling that something is going to happen? You made a promise to jump in the pool. You made a promise. So what that does is it instills within the individual hope that something in this future is going to actually take place because you said it with a promise. You gave me your word. And now if you give me your word, and and I have this trust in your word that what you promise is going to take place. And and I'm not going to really count the days of the time frame, but what you promise is going to take place. You know what this can do for you, especially if it's from God? Are you ready? Maybe not so much in the secular world, but with God, it will bring you peace of mind. Peace of mind. See, sometimes that don't take place for us, does it? I might get into that in just a little bit. I want us to understand this promise thing, especially when we hear it from God. 
In Genesis, I know we're in Hebrews, I'm going to get there in just a sec. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, it is about, it is the story, if you know it, it is the story where Abraham has Isaac, his son, and he is told to take his son and sacrifice him. I want you to go here, Abraham. Hello, Mr. Motorcycle. I want you to go here, Abraham, and I want you to take, um, I don't want you to take us, I don't want you even to be uh, uh, oh, tempted to not sacrifice your son. Do not bring a lamb. Do not bring a ram. Do not bring anything that you can place on the altar except for your son. And I want you to go up, build this altar, lay your son on it, and sacrifice your son Isaac for me. This is God's conversation with Abraham. Abraham, for some reason, had to have so much faith so much trust in God, his father, that, remember, man, I have not, I do not have any heirs. I have no, no, no kids underneath me, God. I'm, I'm, I'm what, a hundred years old and I still don't have kids. And you're promising me descendants? Do you remember that part way before this, this sacrifice? And guess what? So God fulfills his promise to Abraham. You will have descendants. So many descendants. In fact, let me go. Uh, 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 here we are. It says, uh, no, I'm not going to do that one yet. So he, he, he has this conversation with God. And God makes this promise that he's going to multitudes of descendants. See, some of us are like, well, I got, I got uh, 15 in this side of the family. I got another 25 in this side of the family. There was a, a, a small line behind them. But God promised him so many descendants as the stars in the sky. And I'll tell you what, if you've gone out, there are some beautiful stars in the sky in the evenings. Man, I love it. That's me. I go out and, and I crick my neck back. I go, oh, wow. And I just stand there. And sometimes things get blurry. I go, okay, I look down and I look back up again. So many stars. And then not only that, he, he had a, a section, with the grains of sand. We talked about the beach this morning. The grains of sand. You know what? I could scoop up a handful and still not have that many descendants. And yet God promised it to, to Abraham. And here's his son, the promise. Lay him out for a sacrifice. Genesis chapter 22 says this at 15. Abraham sacrifice, excuse me, verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And your offspring sh shall all the nation, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is Abraham, and he's still in conversation with God. He's about to kill his son. And God comes and says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's all I need. All, all I need to know is you would obey my voice. Here's the beautiful thing of God. Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. At this point, you do not have to sacrifice your son. I see your heart. I know who you are. And I'm going to tell you what, Abraham. I swear by myself. This is, see, there is no other one. God Almighty says, I, my word, you will multiply your descendants. And they will be blessed. And the nations beyond them will be blessed. What a promise. Now, I'm going to tell you this. In that promise where God has made this connection beyond the promise, Abraham had to still have faith and trust. Wow, God is going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. Let's keep on going. Because now, ready? We are in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13. We're going to start off 13 through 15. 
For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, ready, obtained the promise. See, we have this story here of Old Testament where God is making this promise. It's an example to us on what God can do. But know this, that God, for all eternity, has, he has had the plan, and he has always had it in motion. And so what he does is he comes to his people, and he reminds them, this is my purpose in your life, and it is in motion. You're not the maker of the purpose. I am the maker of the purpose. And in being the maker of the purpose, I promise you. And in that promise, not just to Abraham, I want you to grab this greater understanding that that promise was for salvation. For all of the generations beyond. Salvation. Now know this. That promise for, a for Abraham given brings us to a promise of knowing through these, this seed, this is going to take place. And this is going to take place. And this is going to take place. In this line of people, this is going to take place. So this is where you have this understanding of when you follow the promise... Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is born of the line of the promise. Jesus Christ is exactly like the purpose God has given to us. And for what purpose? For our salvation. I don't know about you guys. Woohoo! That's a great promise. Nobody can do a better promise than salvation. Now, for me, I'm like this. I hold on to the one who has, I, when, when he says he swears by himself, that means no one can step in place and in front of my promise. I have salvation through Christ. And that salvation, ready, is not just for me, but it is for everyone. Can I tell you what I think is the example with that? Is that we should patiently be waiting. Patiently waiting on the promises of God. You know, we want to hurry things up. Oh, God, please, hurry it up. You know what? <laughs> it's hot, 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 God. Hurry it up. Get us inside. You want to talk about? <laughs> oh. Patience. Patience is a virtue, right? Let's learn it. Why should I have patience? Because my God has made promises that no one can break. No one can get in the way of. Let me ask you some questions then. Ready? What happens when we, when we lie? I'm going to go back to us. What happens when we, when we tell a lie? Hopefully none of you are going, oh, I could just remember that just moments ago. Or not, probably not because we're in church. <laughs> but, you know, yesterday or this morning or I promised this to someone and I actually had no intentions of keeping that promise. I lied making the promise. What happens when we lie? What happens when we lie to others? What happens when we lie, ready, to God? See, some of us think we're so bold, not us. Some people think they're so bold that they could tell God a lie. Like God doesn't know you're lying. What happens when we break our promises and lie? Well, let's be real. Sometimes in our best efforts, we mess up. I'm not making an excuse. Please don't you make an excuse. Pastor said, you know what? I can go ahead and lie all I want and just call it a mistake. No, I did not say that. What I'm saying is sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we break our promises. And we try to uh, decipher and we try to uh, manipulate and we try to make it a reason why it's okay that we had to break this promise. But we still do it. What happens when that takes... See, sometimes I, I, I'm saying this because I want us to have an understanding. When you lie and when you break promises, we make up all these excuses and we think that it's okay. But there's this ripple effect. There is this thing that takes place when you tell a lie. First of all, when you tell a lie, one of the greatest things you have to do is remember the lie so that you can keep telling the lie. 
Oh, what a tangled web we weave. What a tangled web we weave. Meaning this, what you do is you tell this lie and you kind of connect it to this lie and this lie over here. So now you got to remember this was the start and this kind of, and it deciphered, it went off this, it went this way and then it went that way. And you got to try to remember all the things of your lie. And I'm going to tell you what, one of the things when you lie, it is, it is draining. Unless you have a little notebook making a journal of lies. Well, this is how this goes. It's draining because you feel overwhelmed sometimes when you break a promise. It breaks the trust of others. When you break a promise, it breaks the trust of others. When you tell a lie, it breaks the trust of others. How can I ever trust you again? Why? Because your character and all the things that you are prove you're a liar. And so you've broken my trust. So yes, there is the effects that take, you might think, oh, I got away with this, got away with that. And I'm going to tell you this, here's what happens in, in real life. Sometimes people don't even confront you with your lies. And you think you got away with it. But I'm going to tell you right now, they know everything about you and your lie. Because they have found this proof or that proof. Or just in your mere words. You said this yesterday and did nothing about it. And then it breaks the witness. Now I'm going to get spiritual. It breaks your witness. Oh, if that guy goes to church, that lady goes to church, they say they follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, yet they tell lies all the time or they break their promises all the time. I can get that with all my secular friends, with all my non-Christian friends. And I don't have to make a time for an hour at church. You bust, you bust up your witness when you become a false person. Let's go deep now. See, that's us. That's us, right? God's never like that. God never breaks a promise. He never breaks a trust. He never, well, let's get into it. Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 16, down to 20. Yeah, now you go, ooh, all right, pastor. Thank you. You're getting down to the end of it. That's all right. Verse 16 in, in Hebrews chapter 6. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. See, I'm about to go a little bit farther. Just a sec. Understand what was just said there. Your oath. This promise that you have made. That seals the deal. You have made a confirmation of it. And even in all your disagreements, in all your disputes, in all your contradictions, you have made an oath, a confirmation. Verse 17. So when God, now we're going to get to God. So when God desired to show, show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, ready? The unchangeable character of God's purpose. Unchangeable. As he is speaking to those, as for the writer of Hebrews, he speaks today the same way. God is unchangeable and it is the character of his purpose. Ready? And he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two, because God is unchangeable, by two unchangeable things, first of all, in which it is impossible, impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Having become a high priest forever after the old order of Melchizedek. God is unchanging. God is faithful in love. God keeps his promises. 
ready. And the biggest thing for me, when I, see, it's one thing to say God keeps his promises. I want to emphasize, God always follows through. Always. And so here we have, where um, we have God with his two things, uh, a couple of things here, if I may. He never lies. That's easy. Well, of course God don't lie. <laughs> We're the ones that make the mistake. God don't lie. Thank you, God, for forgiving us. May I put that in there? You lie, you lie, you break a promise, ask for forgiveness, which means you have to then man up, woman up, and ask forgiveness for those that you have lied to and broken promises to. But we have to do that. But God himself never lies. And ready? Because he doesn't lie, there are things that come our way. First of all, the thing that comes our way is what? That we have a place that we can draw to that brings to us. Well, first of all, it's a refuge. It is like the canopy over your head. In the sunshine, you'd be like me. Oh, pastor, get me one of those rags from downstairs. I need one too. But you guys are under the shade. It's like this refuge that you can go to. That, remember I talked about uh, when you know that someone's not lying and they keep their promises and they follow through as God? That um, with that, you can have peace of mind. With that, you can have comfort under the refuge. With that, ready, you can have a strong encouragement. How many needs, don't raise your hands. How many needs a strong encouragement? Things are kind of rough this day. Things are kind of rough tomorrow. Things are rough down the way. I can see it. I need a strong encouragement. Pastor, if you could bring that to me. I'm going to tell you this. Start praying because you only see pastor on Wednesdays and Sundays. Maybe you can make a phone call. Maybe I'll call you. But maybe you're standing next to some friends throughout this week. And it's no problem. Ask them, I need some encouragement right now. Which means you probably, probably get some godly friends to give you that good, godly, strong encouragement that comes with no lies. And then let me say this that you get. <sighs> a hope. Now, remember what I said at the very beginning of this as Pastor Mark is getting ready to come forward? Hope is about what is given to you in this moment that leads ahead of you. And when I have that peace, when I have that, that encouragement, when I am in the refuge of God and I am taking in what he has, that hope is far and never unreaching. And the greatest of one, ready? As a child of the king, I will be with him for all eternity. All eternity, I will be with him. And then I'm going to close with this. On the behalf of Jesus, he has gone ahead. Not on his own, for his own, but on my behalf. And on your behalf. And with that... I can trust God. I trust his son. And most of all, come forward, Pastor Mark. I trust as he has given us the Holy Spirit. See, when I talk about, please, the, you can't do it all in one setting. You know what? Please know this. The Holy Spirit brings that encouragement. The Holy Spirit uplifts you. The Holy Spirit gives you peace. The Holy Spirit reminds you of all your promises. The Holy Spirit takes you step by step, day by day. Your hope, if anything, some of you str can struggle with, I don't know how, you know, I know it might be last days. I know my, we talk about eternity. I know I want to be with Jesus. I know all of that. But tomorrow might come, and it might not be that day where the trumpet sounds and takes us home. So let me tell you about that hope. God, I am praying for tomorrow and the hope that you have in it for me tomorrow. Ready? I pray for after lunch, the hope that you have for me. That's the, the steps you have to take. Know this, God never lies, and he will always keep you. Pastor Mark, come as we go. Let us, uh, you know what? I'm going to let you sit, because we're going to sing all these verses at Calvary. One of my favorites. It is at the back of the, the very back of your bulletin, at Calvary. One of the things, you want to talk about the promise? Jesus died for you. He died for me. It's for salvation. And for forgiveness. And he did it at Calvary. 
but he did not just die on a tree and that was the end because he rose again. And this is where you understand the power of resurrection is the power in your life. It is in your life to tell your friends that are lost, that do not know Jesus as Savior, that do not know hope, that do not know, all they know is lies. Bring the truth to them. Let us pray. God, we ask an anointing. If there's someone here that doesn't have that closeness, may they draw close to you, knowing that you died for them and that you, you bring hope, you bring peace, you bring encouragement, you bring life. God, we ask that in our steps that we do not lie, that we do not break promises, that we follow your example and help us in all of that. And in our greatest of mistakes, God, we make no excuse. We ask for forgiveness. And may that be a teachable moment for us and a teachable moment for those that surround us so they can too come to know you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.